ஒரு <laughs> how intercession can be a uh, meaningful and um it can be a process through which we can just just give me a second sorry about that so we have looked at intercession in a meaningful way where it is not a concept that we are going to see or understand in future but something that we can make use of now and we talked about walking in the footsteps so that wherever wherever this person ends up going we end up going in the same place whatever group of people are going in one direction we because we follow their footsteps we are going to also be in the same group of people and shafaat comes from the word of pairing so when we pair something together they're similar so when we become like someone we follow their footsteps we become so similar to them that we are we are now as similar as two shoes that are paired together there's a mirror image there's a reflection of who we are following and that gets absorbed into us and therefore shafaat means that this effort this effort that we made in following our role model will help us because allah will see that okay this person was making so much effort to to grow to learn to follow the footsteps of for example the holy prophet and allah because he will he will be so generous with us he'll say okay this person has made all this effort so let me put them let me mashur them together let me put them together so aitul kursi was bringing us into into these uh, concepts of the heart god and then intercession so we see that there's a there's a hierarchy there's allah subhanahu wa taala there are qualities of allah subhanahu wa taala he doesn't sleep he doesn't become drowsy then he's saying no one can intercede except with my, without my permission and that ends up making us see that allah is talking about two different realities one is allah and then it is his messenger in a hierarchical way and so i'm going to uh, go to the next verse now and i'm just going to read the translation um we finish at aliul azim again aliul azim are beautiful names of allah so i'm just going to going to read this um translation and they cannot encompass anything of his knowledge except that which he wills wills his throne uh, of power and authority encompasses the heavens and the earth and the protection of both the earth and he heavens does not pose him any difficulty he alone is most high most great um and and then we go to the next verse verse 256 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying la ikraha fid din there is no compulsion in religion surely the guidance has been evidently distinguished from error so he who rejects false gods and believes in allah has grasped such a firm hand hold that will never give way and allah is all hearing all knowing قد تبين الرشد من الغي فمن يكفر بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى. So let us look at like Rahaf al-Din and let us understand 
uh, what Allah is saying when he's saying that there is no compulsion in religion. So a lot of times people say that this verse means that when you're within a religion, that is when you don't have a choice inside the religion. But when you're outside the religion, you have a choice of choosing which religion. Like you're free to choose whether you want to be a Muslim or a Hindu or a Christian. But your own your own um, uh, decision when you make your decision to be inside a particular religion, then you have to follow the Sharia and you have to follow the protocols. And then there is no like choice. So I want to break this down and I want to go into first the idea of deen. So if we look at the the concept of deen in Surah Fatiha and we say Malike Yomid Deen, we mentioned that the day of judgment is not just that day, but that day of judgment is the day of accountability and we are accountable in every moment. So Yomid Deen is the moment of accountability towards Allah, which is all the moments in our life. All the moments in our life are moments of accountability. Therefore, if we say there is no compulsion in religion, then that means that you are not bound, you are not in a compulsion to be accountable. You're not, you're not uh, being forced by Allah that, oh, you are accountable to me. So there is no compulsion in you. So, so don't think that I am going to tie your hands and I'm going to force you to be subservient to me and give me your accountability. But Allah is saying uh, in this verse, when he's saying there is no compulsion in deen, surely the guidance has been evidently distinguished from error. So the rushd, the rushd or the, the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, good and bad, Allah Ta'ala is saying that I have put that, that within you. You are able to distinguish between right and wrong. Each human being is born with that inner burhan, inner rush, inner uh, ability to see right from wrong. What ends up happening is that a lot of times we are not willing to see that truth. Our own truth, our own honesty is veiled and we don't want to address it. We don't want to um, look at it. We don't want to see it eye to eye. Why? Because again, there is an accountability. When we look at ourselves, then we will find something within ourselves. When we will find something within ourselves, then we'll have to be accountable for it. So we need to understand that when we are accountable towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we make him our master. And when we make him our master, then we are going to gauge ourselves in his perspective. We are going to look at ourselves from the perspective of God's standard. What is the standard God is keeping for me? But if I am choosing not to be accountable to God, but I want to be accountable to a person, People, parents, spouse, teacher, boss, someone I've fallen in love with. If I'm going to set up my standard according to um, according to somebody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have the freedom. And a lot of us choose that. And a lot of us will choose to be accountable more to people than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more to our children, more to our spouses than the standard that Allah wants from us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have shown you right and wrong. And now it is up to you that you decide who you choose to be accountable to. And there is no compulsion for you who you choose to be accountable to. What happens when we choose Allah and we say, Allah sees my book of accountability or Allah has the right to judge me or not? And what happens when we choose people? So this is something that I've said before that when we choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the master of the to be the master of master to whom we are accountable, then in every moment we we become liberated from 
from what people are thinking of us. And believe me, it can become a very psychologically painful situation if other people are living in your head and you're hearing voices of people saying, you're not looking nice in this color, this color doesn't suit you, um, you shouldn't go to study in that college, but you should go to another college, you shouldn't wear these clothes. Or you went somewhere and you said something and then you're constantly thinking, I don't know what they thought of me. I said this, then I said this, then I said, I don't know what they're thinking about me. I don't know what they perceive me to be. I don't know what image I have formed in their eyes. So when that happens, it becomes a mental disease because you are not able to concentrate on yourself. You're not able to be your authentic self. You are living for people. Now, what is so damaging about relying on people to judge us and people whom we are accountable to is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so loving and so gracious and he is uh, constantly saying that I am Rahman and Rahim, I am Rahman and Rahim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly telling us that, um, just a second. I'm just going to mute you guys because there's some issue with the mic. Okay, thank you. All right, so so the thing is that Allah SWT is constantly reminding us that he's loving, he's Rahman, he's Rahim. So it's kind of easy to make God the one who judges us, to be accountable to God, right? Imagine if you got really tempted and you cheated someone at work and you made a lot of money. Um, what happens if we are accountable to people? People tend to expose us. People tend to judge us harshly. People tend to um, make us feel really ashamed and bad. Um, people don't always have the expansion in the heart to forgive us. Um, so I remember one time, this is uh, a story about my late grandfather, my mother's father, and I was very, very close to him. Um, and he was working until he was 90 years old, 92 years old. He was working. He used to go to work every day. Um, sometimes he would even take a bus to go to work and over here it's not like a simple procedure to get on a bus and go far but he was a hard-working man uh, he came from uh, being an orphan to building a huge life for himself and his children and when in when he got really old he had a, a boy helping him with the accounts in his office and for many years, that boy was helping my Nana. And then he moved to Dubai for work. He said, I have a better opportunity. And my Nana blessed him and said, you know, I wish you all the best. And he went away. After three to four years, that boy came back. And he told my Nana that he had been meddling with the accounts. And he had uh, taken some money. And... It was so beautiful that my Nana, he turned around and he said that it must have taken you a lot of courage to come and tell me. And it's not easy for someone to own up to their guilt of doing this. So my Nana said, I don't want your money. I'm just really proud of you that you owned up to your mistake. And I still wish you all the best. And you don't owe me anything as long as you realize that you have wronged someone and you have wronged your soul. And it was such a beautiful experience for me because I knew the man who was working for my Nana. He used to come to the house for accounts. My Nana was very old, so he couldn't take care of those accounts by himself. But what I also hear is that as my Nana was aging, um, people around him kept telling me that he was getting very merciful. He was becoming more and more soft and kinder and loving and forgiving. So either that can happen to us as we grow older because we work on ourselves and our soul kind of softens or it can keep getting more bitter and harsher and grumpier 
because there are a lot of old people, right? If you think about them, telling them that I embezzled and I took away or I stole money from you, I mean, they can get really mad and they can get very irritated and they can get very grouchy about the whole situation. But I mean, my Nana was so old and he chose to be merciful and forgiving. So there is that risk of being accountable to people that they may shame you, they may treat you badly, they may, you know, blame you instead of seeing the fact that, wow, you've come back and you've asked for forgiveness. And we see that same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, we see that, um, that, um, that expansive heart in Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And what we see is that that some scholars, they say that if you see the life of Imam Hussain, as he was growing older, he was becoming kinder, more loving, more forgiving. His heart got bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of letting go. Um, you know, people say that at the time when Imam Ali was um, struck with the sword, uh, Imam Hussain was very different then. And then Imam Hussain was very different at the time of Karbala. So we see that as we are growing, we are constantly working. We can be working towards expanding or we can be complacent and we can leave ourselves to the whims of life and it can end up making us more bitter. So the choice is ours. Who are we going to be accountable to? And the biggest advantage of being accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah doesn't, you know, Allah says in the Quran that I don't, uh, I don't know, in Gujarati we have the same word or in Urdu we say jatana, like you show off and you make the other person feel small and you say, look, look, I did this for you. Or yeah, I'm so great, I helped you. Or like, oh, remember that day I helped you? You owe me a favor kind of thing. Allah doesn't do that. Allah doesn't uh, make us feel like we're, we we owe him anything. So Allah keeps giving and Allah keeps listening. But Allah doesn't make us feel blamed or shamed or that we owe him anything for the favors he does, does towards us. So accountability to Allah then liberates us from the accountability to people. How does that happen? So if you um, did not have the intention of cheating someone at work, if you didn't have that intention, and you went in with the clear conscience of you know, being fair, being just in business, Right. And if we uh, if we did it with the right intention, but it ends up happening that someone in the middle misguides us or we get confused or we make a mistake in counting the numbers or or we by mistake we misplace the money or by mistake we take extra money and give them less money, then if we were clear in our conscience and intention and we have to be accountable to this person about money or business or whatever, we don't feel guilty and we don't feel bad about it. Even though there will be a voice in our head saying, I wonder what that person thinks of me now. He or she must think that I'm a crook. He or she must think that I'm, I'm a shady person or I'm a bad person then how can you treat that voice in your head? How can you treat that self-doubt? How can you bring yourself back into a state of grace in the eyes of God from where you feel fallen? Because you were clear on your intention. So somebody says, hey, look, you added extra money in your account, but you gave me less. I'm feeling like I can't trust you anymore. And you can just turn around and say, you know what, that's okay. I know that I have made a mistake which uh, which would make anyone doubt my actions, but I want to really, really assure you that I had no such intention. And here you go. This is your extra money. Please take it right away. Why? Because you had done your inner work on your intention. What happens when we 
haven't done that work on the intention, we jump right into answering, we jump right into giving a reply or responding, we jump right into making the accounts the way they should have been, is that it's not necessary that you did it out of a bad intention, but because you had no intention sorted out, you doubt yourself. And you end up looking like you had a bad intention. So if they say, hey, listen, you put more money in your own account and less in mine. You're like, really? Oh, my God. How did that happen? Um, I have no idea. And you're flustered and you're like, okay, just let me have a look at it. Or like, or you might get defensive and go like, no, I have done no such thing. And how dare you speak to me like that, right? In both these scenarios, you're, you had not sorted out your intention. If you have not sorted out your intention, you'll be flustered and confused what to say and how to sort out the situation. But if you're always clear about your intention and if you're always very, you know, uh, to the point about the fact that, no, I don't believe in cheating someone with money or misguiding someone or manipulating someone, then you'll be very clear and you'll be like, uh, if that has happened, then I apologize. I'll send the money right away. I had no such intention. And uh, if that hasn't happened, then, you know, um, I don't think it's nice for you to say such a thing. And then at the same time, you're not confused or flustered or doubting yourself or getting um, these doubts about your own self-image. Oh my God, what do they think of me now? How could I have been so stupid? How did I make this mistake? Because you knew what you were doing. You know how you think. You know a part of you. You realize who you are. Um, and so that's why we say that when you know yourself, that's how you know your God. Why? You know who you make your God. It, if you know yourself, and yourself says, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I can cheat. You know, it's their job to check the accounts. And if they can't check the accounts, I think I am free to take the money. Now, Allah is saying in, uh, in this word, I have put the distinction between right and wrong, good and bad in your heart. I've given that faculty of dis discernment to you. But what are you doing? You are choosing to ignore it. You are choosing to uh, deny it and then you are doing something wrong because now your accountability is not to the higher power. And now when you are saying that, yeah, it's okay, then your rushed is getting uh, compromised. Your power to see right and wrong is getting compromised. Your accountability is not to God but your accountability is to yourself and the lower self that is greedy. Now what is going to happen is that you are going to realize that, yeah, I know, I think I am my God. I follow what I think is right. I follow what I feel like doing. I do as I please. Instead, oh, my God, my Lord, my Allah is watching me. And I don't think it's right to cheat anyone no matter what, even though I need the money or I'm tight on money or owning up my mistake will look so bad that people will, I will ruin my reputation or people will doubt me for future business deals or whatever. So when you're worshiping yourself, it becomes very complicated to decide what should be my next move. How should I deal with this situation? What am I supposed to do over here? And then people go on asking other people, oh, this is a situation, what do you think I should do? This is a situation, what do you think I should do, right? And honestly, for some questions, there is no answer anyone can give us. Why? Because we have to be very honest and authentic with ourselves and then ask that question within ourselves. And though that kind of interrogation deep within us will make us more aware of who we are. So, for example, if someone wants to, um, 
get a second wife. And it's not something I encourage and I don't even I I don't even believe that it's part of Islam anymore and people can challenge me on that. Um but if somebody wants to do that and they're just going to uh, they're just like, you know, yeah, I I need another woman. Uh, Islam allows four wives, um, blah, 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 then their intention is maybe the self. Because maybe they have a personal agenda to get married. But if they were really, really honest, and they were really trying to be accountable to God, why are they getting a second wife? Then a lot of other aspects of personality can open up, which can say, you know what, your your intention is to get outer validation. You want another woman to praise you. You want another woman to do X Y Z for you. Uh, you're getting old, so you want an you want a younger wife because it makes you feel like you've got a trophy. There can be so many reasons, right? It's a reality. In that situation, if a person realizes that it's for the self because it makes me feel good and I'm doing this act because I like it and Islam is allowing it, even then this act may be right according to Sharia, but it's not going to help you grow into a better person. It's not coming from a place of that sincere intention where you're saying, I want to do this because it's the right thing to do. Or I want to do this because it's good for my soul. And why is it good for my soul, etc. And I don't mean to judge anyone. I'm just giving one, one person's limited thinking in taking a decision. Maybe someone can have a valid reason. Maybe someone has a very sincere intention. Maybe someone has the right reasons to do something like that. I don't mean to generalize. But I'm saying that these situations happen. And a lot of times people just put it in that, you know, uh, that circle and say, well, it's part of Islam, so it's allowed. It's part of Islam, so I want to do it. It's part of Islam, Sharia-wise, Malanas agree with it, so I'm going to do it. So in that sense, we realize that, no, a lot of times we're just using religion as an excuse to get to ourselves. We're using religion, you know, uh, in Pakistan, they do honor killing um, and they say, well, you know, we have the right to kill somebody um, because they have brought dishonor to us, right? And then it's not investigated how and what of it. And there are verses in the Quran that talk about these ideas and they're just picked up and then used for people's you know, agendas, their egos, their motives. Therefore, when Allah is saying there is no force, there is no compulsion in religion, he's talking about the free will we have in terms of who we make the judge of our action. If we are going to make ourselves the judge of our actions, if you're going to make the world the judge of our actions, remember, we are flawed. We are weak, we are broken, we are not reliable. And neither is the world. Neither are the people in this world. They're just like us. No matter how much, you know, they have studied, no matter how much they've traveled the world, no matter how wise they look, after all, they are a human being and they are limited. So who is going to be my judge and who am I going to be accountable to? I have to decide that according to my own inner faculty of right and wrong. And then what is Allah saying? That the uh, Allah is saying that um, so he who rejects the false gods and believes in Allah has grasped such a firm handhold that will never possibly give way. And Allah is all hearing and all knowing. How beautifully Allah puts these things together. When Allah is saying, okay, when you are going to reject the gods, so who are the gods? Society is the god. Parents can become god. Spouse can become god. Your children can become god. Your reputation can become your god. Your job can become your, your um, god. Um, 
you know your you all of these things that become your god allah is saying that when you reject them and when you grasp a firm handhold in when when you believe in allah as your only god then you get a firm handhold what does that mean this is what it means it means that when you come to allah you become liberated from everyone else and with allah there is so much security and so much surety because allah is the only entity who is free of taghayyur who is free of change who is free of constant flux allah is not having you know god forbid mood swings allah is not having weak health and good health allah is not feeling moody you know allah has no cycles um allah is uh, not doing favoritism right allah is just allah is constantly a reliable uh, point of access for us that if we hold on to that point of access there is going to be a stability in our life there is going to be a re relatively a smooth going because you know what to expect of god you know what to you know that this entity is not going to let me down because this entity has never ever defaulted on the night not changing into day or the day not changing into night this this entity has always made sure that the earth doesn't collapse uh and the systems of gravity are working perfectly and i mean there are millions of miracles of god that are so amazing um i was li looking at this um uh, research that has come out that when when we do physical workout um our muscles actually produce these hormones that make us happier so when we do laborious work right when we're using our body and we're doing something then it makes us happy and it got me thinking that there was a time when the human being was harvesting cooking hunting um cleaning they were doing all of that um and then what happened is that we evolved and now when we sit in our offices and we don't have to do a lot of laborious work and physically taxing work um now we feel like oh i am more successful um but what is the system saying that when you do active work when you do physical work that's when hormones are released in your through your muscle activation which the doctors call the call the hope hormone okay it's like the hope hormone that is released in your body now imagine someone who is in an it job top of his line sitting at the computer working all day making millions but he has no physical organic uh, work happening so he has to schedule a time to go to the gym schedule an alarm to get up and start walking you know like the apple watch will tell you time to take a walk um so naturally this person is earning a lot of money but he's not living an organically natural life of a human being whose work requires him to do physical activity so as the pay grade is going up the the way the system of the world is evolving is that as the as the pay grade is going up people are becoming more and more sedentary they're not moving much they're sitting in their chairs okay now a lot of these people you know they're coming up with um adventurous workplaces and adventurous jobs which are niche jobs etc but most of the work of these these high end ceos is to just sit in an office and do the work but what about i mean you know in our country the the laborers that we have uh, the masons the ones who build put the blocks to build a house or uh, people who do cleaning in our homes you know they they're working they're walking they're carrying weight their natural way of life gives them a lot of health you know 
yes, I understand that food is very corrupted and adulterated with chemicals and fertilizers and whatnot. But then the per the human being who is harvesting his own food, who is working hard the whole day, who is involved in a physical activity the whole day, was also automatically living a happy life because it was releasing these hormones. It was releasing these hope hormones, happy hormones, um, and it kept their life going very well. Now, one very important thing that I want to share here is about um, psychological health, perhaps psychiatric health. And I wanted to share that this taboo around um, taking medication. Why is it connected to my talk topic is because we were talking about how we perceive what is good for us is not actually good for us. And Allah says that in the Quran. Perhaps something you think is good for us is bad for you. And what you think is bad for you is good for you. So the Quran is telling us that. And then we're seeing that as we're becoming richer and we're sitting more and more in bigger offices, that we're becoming less and less active and our mental health is getting affected. Compared to those who are doing physical labor, they're automatically uh, living a calmer, happier life because physical activity the whole day is giving them the right hormones to stabilize their hormones. But because now we are in that situation that we don't have that kind of physical activity, we don't have so much sun exposure, we need medication sometimes to balance out the chemicals in our body. Now, what does medication do? Okay, I want to remove the taboo around psychiatric help and going and taking medication for mental uh, situations because I have myself benefited from such treatment and I used to be dead against it. And I used to feel like no matter what happens, I will never take, you know, antidepressants or hormones or whatever, right? Because no, no, they're addictive and they do this and do that. But you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have not created a problem for which I've already created a solution for you. Okay. So I noticed that there are two very big advantages of taking psychiatric help and go going and using the medication with the right doctor and with constant checkups and monitoring your the doses of your medication and then being religious about how and what the doctor gives you the dose to be. Number one, life throws us in the pit sometimes. And when we're going through a very difficult situation in life, um, we can't leave the situation, but we need more strength to deal with the situation. Okay. And we see that our ancestors perhaps had more emotional threshold to compromise, to, to you know, um, to be able to deal with difficult situations and go get through it. Uh, hence, there was less divorces and all of that. And I'm not saying that someone who's going through potential abuse and 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 uh, physical abuse should make a marriage work no matter what. But I would say that before we break the last twig, before we take the last step, before we take the last decision, to break off a marriage or break off a relationship or take a harsh step in our life, we need to understand also that sometimes dealing with the situation for too long drains us of our energy, drains us because a situation which is very intensely emotional can scar us. It can give us a wound, a deep emotional wound. Now, if I don't do anything to heal that wound and I allow it to be scraped and cut into again and again and again, there is going to be no healing. No matter how much we keep praying, no matter how much we telling, tell God, yes, when we keep praying, Allah might put it in your heart to take medicine. Allah might put it in your heart to go for therapy. Allah might put it in your heart to get some counseling or coaching. Or, or separate yourself from the situation. But you have to take that step. And what medicine does is that it will prevent you from getting as triggered 
by the same situation. So when someone tells a, a person, oh my God, you're so dark, you'll never get married. This is just a very run of the mill example, very, um, you know, silly thing I'm saying, but it's just a hypothetical example that I'm getting, saying. Oh, you're very dark, you will never get married. Now, this is something that you've heard like a million times. It has hurt you. It has scarred you. It has affected your self-esteem. I have no doubt that unless you do your inner work, the next time someone says that, it is going to be hurtful. In fact, with all of those years of being taunted and lagged that, someone who comes and says, oh, you're so dark, you will never get married, may cause a traumatic trigger. Because it's a trigger for you. It's a wound. It's a place of pain for you. So what will the medication do? It will hold back the intensity of the effects of being triggered. And so you'll be able to deal with the same situation. If I can say the word calmly, then calmly or in a more numbed way. What is that doing now? It is giving you that breathing space to begin to heal that inner wound. So slowly, slowly, you get on medication, you get that inner space, you don't get as triggered by the situation, so you don't react as badly, so situations don't fall into bigger cycles of turmoil, aggression, argument, and you break that cycle. That gives respite to yourself and your environment and the people in your environment or the relationship which is getting directly affected. And through that breaking of the cycle, everyone gets that breathing space to let go of the old grudges, resentment, anger, unforgiveness. All of that gets its time in the sun to heal. And when the intense need for that medication, uh, you know, becomes less, then the doctor can reduce your doses. The doctor can change your medication, make it more mild, or even take you off any medication if, if you're changing and your situation's changing. So that is one thing. The other thing is that a lot of times when the pain becomes too intense, and a lot of times when the situation gets really out of hand and you find it very difficult to deal with it, then you go for counseling without medication. But because you're already so burnt out, a lot of times counseling cannot work. Counseling won't help. Because you have no space to hear anything. You have no capacity to speak anything. You keep going from one therapist to another and you're like, it's not helping. Talking is not helping. Sharing myself is not helping. Some people will even say, why, why do I go and talk to a stranger? Why should I share my personal thoughts with a stranger? So counseling doesn't work. But when you start going on medication, medication gives you that space to rethink, to get that energy back, emotional and mental energy back, to actually see things with a clearer vision, with the open vision, you know, you start to gauge the situation in a better way. You can see yourself. Look, if all your life you were taunted by your elders and you were constantly criticized and you have a scar around being criticized, you get married and your husband says one thing for you, to you. Uh, like, hey, you were looking so pretty in white, but black really doesn't suit you. Now that's a criticism, right? It... It is not nice for someone to say something like that, but a lot of times our reaction to that is a hundred times more than it needed to be. Instead of saying, hey, buddy, I don't like it when someone says nasty things to me or bad things to me about my clothes. I'm really sensitive about it. That's a way of communicating how you felt. Instead, you're like, how dare you say this? I have lived like this forever. I will not allow you to do this. You're, you know, these men, who do you think you are that you can just come and criticize me or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It can take a very different route. It can get multiplied in its intensity because of the wound you hold within you. And therefore, it becomes very important that in order for us to 
understand truly what is the issue here is it really in that person to the extent that i think it is in them or there is something within me that is also getting triggered and there's a cumulative effect of both the things coming together and making me feel like my life is going to end or i can't do this anymore this is the end of it and i don't have more capacity to do this life so all in all what medication does is that it gives you a breather it gives you the space it gives you the capacity and the stamina to listen because i have always been a propagator of the idea that when you change yourself your outer reality changes the way you if you change the way you look at things the things you look at change i'm always a believer in that whatever is within you is a reflection of what is outside of you what is outside of you is a reflection of what is within you so because it is all about our thoughts it is all about the way the mind is working the subconscious mind and the conscious mind medication can help us get out of the rut and the cycle of negative thinking pessimistic thinking uh depression feeling like there is no hope left and it can elevate our situation it can elevate our thoughts to a place where now you feel a renewed capacity to build a better life to have a positive outlook to life to not be so triggered when someone says hey listen um there are mistakes that you're making which are you know leading to these problems in your life and for example if you just spoke like this or you acted like this or you thought like this things could change in your life where do we get that capacity to to hear someone giving us a counsel a lot of times we are we're so burnt out we're so upset we've heard so many people give us so many unsolicited advice that we feel sick and tired of hearing more advice so definitely go down the route of finding a life coach a mentor a teacher uh it is very very important to have a teacher in life someone older someone more experienced someone wiser someone calmer than us and if we need professional help then going to see a counselor um and some life coach and then we can see if we are repeating ourselves in loops constantly and we're not able to get out of that same thought again and again and we're not able to break the cycle of that thought that ends you up in the same position again and again then consider seeing a psychiatrist let your psychologist and psychiatrist come together to come up with a good plan for you uh stay com under complete monitoring of your doctor take your medication don't leave them on your own uh don't take it lightly that if i leave it it's okay it's a whole science i'm not equipped you're not equipped if you're a therapist for sure if you're a psychiatrist for sure but the ones who are specifically trained in this me medicine psychiatric medicine stick to professional stick to your routine don't you know um uh, don't uh change things around yourself and you'll see that with the right kind of guidance a lot of times you have to change the medicines also if something is not suiting you if certain symptoms develop it's not easy but it is surely a way to seek help and it is very very important that if we have something that can help us break out of our negative cycles then then we go for that instead of suffering in silence instead of feeling hopeless instead of feeling there is no solution so before we before we take any drastic steps in our life i would say that if things are confusing if you need your own inner heart your your own inner guidance your own inner rush to guide you between the right and the wrong if there is a confusion then seek help speak to mentors talk to people who've been there um seek counseling therapy and if you need medication then don't be scared of it go for it try it in the right manner with the right protocols and i truly believe that it can be a very very helpful tool in dealing with very severe and very 
um, difficult situations in life. And by severe, I don't mean something which looks huge, but by severe, I mean your own inner state, the, the, the level of despair you feel within you, the level of helplessness you feel within you is what makes the situation severe. So for me also, my taboo around medicine, my stigma around uh, psychiatric medicine, clinical uh, you know, prescription was broken by my friend who told me, who's, who, who was my mentor at the time and, and suggested that I should go and see because she felt like, like my situation would uh, get really helped uh, by medication. And I had no idea. I had no idea that I needed it. It's when the doctor analyzed and said, yeah, you do need it and you can really like benefit from it. And I did. And because now that I have benefited so immensely, I am in a position to, to tell others that there is a lot of good in this as well. So I am going to now wrap up the session. I started late, so I thought of ending late, but I know that people have to, to, to be somewhere or they have to you know get done with their routines as well. So today we discussed, like Rafiddin, that there is no compulsion in who we are accountable to, but then if we choose to be accountable to Allah, then it can be a very liberating experience because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a constant in our life who can hold us, who can take care of us. And the following verse is saying that surely guidance has been evidently distinguished, that right and wrong has been clearly shown to us. If, if the right and wrong is evident to us, then it is not difficult for us to be accountable to God. Because now we know the difference between right and wrong. But a lot of times that inner clarity gets affected a lot of times that inner voice gets affected, inner connection to Allah gets affected. And for that, when we come back to Allah and we let go of people and we take these difficult steps of healing, of growing, of learning with faith instead of fear, again, with medicine also, we have a lot of fears, right? Uh, so no, let's not, okay, we've tried everything, we've talked to people, we've taken coaching, health, whatever, now, the next step is to go for medication. Don't be scared. Don't be fearful. Have a discipline around your medication with complete consultation, but then have faith that if Allah has given this solution, then there is good in this for me. And then when we work with our mental, with our spiritual, with our emotional health in a holistic way, then we can truly grow. We can change ourselves. We can break out of our habits that make us feel stuck our own habits which we are not able to break and we feel like I'm not good enough or no matter how much I try it doesn't change in me or no matter what I do I'm just going to stay the same that kind of cycle can break and we have to break that because we have to grow holistically as we're growing older we want to be more wiser we want to be calmer we want to have that sense of calm or in us like I gave the example of my grandfather that if we are healing in the right way uh, then for sure there will be a holistic growth and while I'm at it let me share one more thing about my grandfather that he spent many hours every day reading till the last I mean until he was in bed he had these thick glasses. He would read the newspaper every day. He would read lots of books on tafsir. And he never proclaimed to be a scholar, but he always thought of himself as a student, always kept reading. Obviously, he never used the devices that we have today. But one of the things I always saw him doing was he sat outside in sunlight many hours at a time. And he used to walk barefoot in the grass. And he only had 10% vision in one eye for almost 30 years. He lived with that 10% vision in one eye. And he took care of himself by walking in the grass, looking at the green grass. Um, they say that if we look at green grass, it increases the light in our eyes. He walked in the green grass, which hurts us and releases us of negative charge. 
the sunlight, extremely energizing, extremely cleansing for our aura. And he used to read a lot, which kept his mind very fresh and working. He didn't have any diseases like diabetes, blood pressure, heart, nothing. He was walking till the very end. Um, and one more thing that I always saw him doing is that he always ate less. He had his three meals and he had his evening tea with a little biscuit. I, I never saw him do any kind of um, dieting in the sort like, oh, I have diabetes, so I, can have I cannot have sugar or I have blood pressure, so I can't have sweet. He ate everything. He ate sugar. He ate salty food. He had a biscuit every day with his tea. He, he enjoyed good meals he loved like our pakistani barbecued food he used to love it so you know the oily parathas that come with it he he ate it till the very end but he always ate little so the prophet also says that fill your stomach three-fourth one-third you have to leave it leave it empty and i saw him live till the age of 95 or 97 he was working till the end. He had his soul intact. He had, uh, he was growing. He was changing. He was becoming kinder, more merciful. And he had good health, physical health also. So um, let's end uh, uh, our session here today. Uh, I just felt this desire to share these uh, beautiful qualities of my grandfather today. His name was Abdul Tayyab, Abdul Qadir Bhanpuri. And uh, I would request you all to pray Fatiha if that's okay. Um, and for all of our Marhumeen, for my grandmother and everyone, for all of your Marhumeen. Um, and we send them a, a note of gratitude for them and doing what they did. Um, and the way we learn from them and the way we grew from them and where we are today is because we stand on their shoulders. So I request you all to pray Surah Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Oh Allah, we come to you with our feeble selves, unreliable. Oh Allah, we know we cannot trust ourselves. One day we are one and the other day we are another person. We are broken. Our hearts are fragile, O oh Allah. Fill it with your light. Strength, strengthen it with your with your yaqeen and iman. And O oh Allah, never leave us to our own. Please do our islah, do our guidance, hold our hands and take us in the right direction of whatever is good for us. And prevent us, stop us from going in the direction which is not good for us. O oh Allah, show us the right ways of healing. Ola, you are the ultimate healer. Ola, you are the one who actually heals us. Ola, bring healing to us, your healing to us through all the right means, through all the right vessels, through all the right people, through all the right modalities that are good for us so that we can live up to our highest potential, so that we can live up to our actualization. Ola, help us in this path. Amin Ya Rabbal Alameen. Thank you everyone for joining and bless you all. Have a lovely um, weekend. Um, thank you Amna for always being so encouraging. Um, and uh, I, I honestly sometimes feel, I don't know what I was rambling, but you guys are so gracious and so supportive and so loving. May I like that these efforts. Take care. Allah Hafiz.